Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wade Davis. Well, thanks very much, and it's really a delight to be back in Yellowknife. And I'd like to, of course, acknowledge the um, support of the Canadian Polar Commission, the Heritage Centre, the Chilto government, um, and of course the uh, Chief Dry Geese, uh, Treaty 8 people upon whose land we are, and the Yellow, Yellow Knives Dene for welcoming me into their territory. Um, you know, one of the uh, great delights and pleasures of travel is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel the pass in the wind, touch it in stones polished by rain, and taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that in the Amazon, jaguar shamans still journey beyond the Milky Way, or that in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning, or that in the high Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma, is to remember the central revelation of anthropology. And that is the idea that the world into which you were born does not exist in some absolute sense, but is just one model of reality, the consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that your intellectual lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, a yak herder on the slopes of Chomalungma, Mount Everest, an eagle hunter of central Kazakhstan, or a thunderhoof shaman of Mongolia, all of these peoples teach us there are other ways of being, other ways of thinking, other ways of orienting yourself in social, spiritual, ecological space. And that's an idea that if you think about it can only fill you with hope. Now together the myriad of peoples, the myriad of cultures of the world envelop the globe and create a kind of a web of life that is as important to the well-being of the planet as is the biological web of life that you know so well as a biosphere. And a book that I wrote, I coined the term ethnosphere to kind of create an organizing principle for this realm of social life. And I defined the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and dreams, ideas and intuitions, myths and memories brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative and in innovative species. And just as the biosphere is being severely eroded with the loss of habitat and the loss of plant and animal life, so too is the ethnosphere, but if anything, at a far greater rate. No biologist, for example, would dare suggest that 50% of all plants and animals are on the brink of extinction because it simply is not true. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of that, of course, is language loss. When each of us were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. Now, a language is not simply vocabulary or grammar. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes in the material world. I, I once wrote that every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages spoken the day that you were born, by absolute consensus amongst academic linguists, fully half aren't being whispered into the ears of infants which means effectively that they're on the brink of extinction. And what this effectively means is that we're living through a time where in a single generation, fully half of humanity's intellectual, social, spiritual knowledge is being lost in a generation. Now, there are many people who say, what a great idea. Wouldn't the world be a better place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be easier for us to get along. And my answer to that is always to say, well, that's a really great idea. But let's make that universal language Nuptatuk. Let's make it Tibetan. Let's make it Quechua. And you begin to feel, as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability 
to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. And yet that dreadful fate is indeed the plight of somebody every two weeks because on average, every fortnight, some elder passes away and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. Now the reason this is so particularly poignant in this moment in time is that it's occurring in the very generations when science in the realm of genetics has finally proven it to be true, something that philosophers have always hoped to be true, and that is the fact that we're all brothers and sisters. Now I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean quite literally studies of the human genome in our generation have left no doubt that the human genetic endowment is a single continuum. Race is an utter fiction. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. We are in fact all descendants of a handful of people who walked out of Africa some 65,000 years ago and then embarked on this extraordinary hegira, a diaspora 2,500 human generations in duration, 40,000 years that carried the human spirit to every single corner of the habitable world. But if you accept that scientific truth, you have to accept its corollary. If all human populations are cut from the same genetic cloth, every human society shares by definition the same raw intellectual genius, the same mental acuity. And critically, whether that raw genius is invested in technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement in the West, or placed by contrast into the complex task of unraveling the threads of memory from a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no evolutionary progress in the affairs of culture. That old Victorian idea that we somehow went from the you know, savage to the barbarian to the civilized, the strand in London, that idea that there was this apex of development upon which European society capped the summit has been utterly debunked by modern scholarship and shown to be as much uh, an artifact of the 19th century as is the idea that clergymen had then that the earth was but 4,000 years old. And so in a stunning kind of affirmation of the human spirit, we have realized the essential interconnectedness of humanity. And what this ultimately means is very simple. The other peoples of the world, the other cultures of the world are not failed attempts at being you. They're not failed attempts at being modern. Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different voices. And those voices collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us as a species in the ensuing millennia. But the great challenge is what do we do about this? You know, if you're a biologist and you identify an area of high species endemism, you can create a protected area. But you can't make a rainforest park of the mind. You can't freeze peoples in time like some kind of zoological specimen. I mean, change is one constant in human history. All peoples everywhere are always dancing with new possibilities for life. And so when I was recruited to the National Geographic as part of our conservation mission, we decided that polemics were never persuasive. Politicians um, follow, but they rarely lead. But storytellers can change the world. And we thought that what we could do, perhaps, is take our enormous audience, 165 million people every week in all languages and in all quarters of the world, and take them to areas where the cultural beliefs and practices were so transparently dazzling that you couldn't help but come away with a new appreciation of culture. And so let me take you this afternoon to some of these areas of wonder. And let's begin in the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination. And that, of course, is Polynesia. Tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon the southern seas. And I was very fortunate some years ago to be invited by the Polynesian Voyaging Society to sail on the sacred canoe, the Hokalea which has become the symbol of cultural revival and revitalization throughout all of Polynesia. And even today, the Polynesian sailors can name 350 stars in the night sky. 
They can sense the presence of distant atolls of islands beyond the visible horizon simply by watching carefully the reverberation of waves across the hull of the vessel, knowing full well that every island group in the Pacific has a unique refractive pattern that can be read with the same ease with which a forensic scientist would read a fingerprint. These are sailors who, in the darkness of the hull, can distinguish as many as five different sea swells moving through the canoe at any one point in time, distinguishing those caused by local weather patterns from the deep currents that pulsate across the Pacific and can be followed with the same ease with which a terrestrial explorer would follow a river to the sea. And the most amazing thing about this tradition was that it was all based on dead reckoning. Now, dead reckoning only means that you only know where you are at any one point in time by remembering precisely how you got there. Now, it was the impossibility of using dead reckoning in a multi-week oceanic voyage that kept European sailors hugging the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of the chronometer. But we know for an absolute scientific fact that 10 centuries before Christ, the ancestors of the Polynesian people from an ancient civilization called Lapita, located off the shores of New Guinea, set sail into the rising sun. In a thousand years, they reached Samoa and Tonga, and then they waited for 10 centuries, and then they sailed on, spreading all the way across the Pacific 4,000 kilometers to the Marquesas, southeast to Rapa Nui, Easter Island, northwest to Hawaii, and eventually around the time of the First Crusade, reaching uh, Eotearoa, what we now call New Zealand. All of this meant that the wayfinder, sitting monk-like on the stern of the vessel, with no tradition of the written word, with no scientific navigation aids whatsoever, had to remember every shift of current, a direction, every sign of the stars, the moon, the sun, and the sea itself, all of which had to be absorbed and remembered in the single imagination of the individual. And the point is that if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. Now, if we slip from the greatest ocean sphere into the greatest forest, we enter the homeland of the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana, the Makuna, the Tanimukos, peoples of the northwest Amazon of Colombia, people who live so intimately with that forest that cognitively they do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the rainforest. And if we come down the flanks of the Andes, we enter the homeland of the Warani, a remarkable people first peacefully contacted in 1957. In, in 1958, in 1957, five missionaries attempted contact and made a critical mistake. They dropped from the air eight by 10 glossy photographs of themselves and what we would say culturally in the dominant society were friendly gestures, forgetting that the people of the rainforest had never seen anything two-dimensional in their lives. So they picked up the photographs from the forest floor, looked behind the face to try to find the form to the figure, saw nothing, and concluded that these were calling cards from the devil, and they promptly speared the five missionaries to death. But they didn't just spear outsiders, 54% of their mortality was due to them spearing each other. And yet they had a knowledge of the rainforest that was astonishing. Their hunters could smell urine at 40 paces and tell you what creature left it behind, not because they were sauvage in some kind of Rousseauian sense, but because they were true natural philosophers who over the generations had come to understand that forest so well because it was a forest upon which their lives depended. I was very fortunate as a young anthropologist to fall into the orbit of, at Harvard of a legendary botanical explorer, Richard Evans Schultes, a man who shot blowguns in class and kept outside his door a bucket of peyote buttons available to his students as an optional laboratory experiment. Uh, Schultes was an odd choice to be a 60s icon because it's true that he had sparked the psychedelic era with his discovery of the so-called magic mushrooms in Mexico in 1938, but he, he was, in, politically, he was rabidly conservative. He didn't vote for the Republican Party in the States. He professed not to believe in the American Revolution. He always voted for Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. One of his colleagues said the only way Schultes could go native, as it was said, uh, would, would be to go to London. 
Uh, and I knew none of this at the age of 18 when I knocked on his fourth floor Erie and I got as far as saying, sir, I'm from British Columbia. Well, that's all it took. That adjective British together with Columbia because he thought I was talking about the other Columbia, which of course the Columbia of South America where he had disappeared in 1941 to spend 13 uninterrupted years going down unknown rivers, living among unknown peoples, all the time enchanted by the wonder of the equatorial rainforest. In time, mountains would bear his name, as would national parks. And I simply said to him, Sir, I'm from British Columbia. I want to go to the Amazon as you did and collect plants. At the time, I had never taken a biology course in my life. I knew nothing about botany, nothing about the Amazon. Instead of grilling me for my credentials, he simply looked across a mound of plant specimens and peered through his antiquated bifocals and said very simply, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I was in the Amazon where I stayed for a year and a half. But just before going, leaving, he said, never forget that the difference between a poison, a medicine, a hallucinogen, and a narcotic is simply dosage. And, <laughs> and, but that was actually the adage of the great uh, Swiss uh, scholar Paracelsus. And that was his way of saying, be on the lookout for any biodynamic plant. And, of course, medicines aren't used literally. We're looking for biodynamic compounds that we can uh, use in uh, our modern Materia Medica. And a perfect example of this, of course, is a flying death. Curare, the poisons derived from many different species that are used in the hunting technology. But these, of course, are muscle relaxants, and they yield a detubo curare, the muscle relaxants that transformed abdominal surgery in the 1940s. And this search for biodynamic plants invariably led into the realm of the shaman. Now, if you follow the academic work of those great scholars like Shirley MacLaine, you would think that uh, shaman are these kind of benign men and women with feathers and bells who sing a lot. I've been with shaman all around the world, and I've never met one who wasn't just a little psychotic. I mean, that's their job. I mean, they're the ones who go into the mystic waters the rest of us want to avoid as we're simply raising our children. They're the ones who must invoke some technique of ecstasy to soar away on the wings of trance, to get into those metaphysical domains where they can work their deeds of medical, magical, mystical rescue. And that accounts for one of the most curious anomalies in botanical science. And that is the fact of the 120 known hallucinogenic plants, 95% are from the Americas. Not because the forests of equatorial West Africa or Southeast Asia were depauperate, but simply because peoples there had other avenues to the divine. But in the Americas, the route to the Godhead was through these curious plants, like this one in a photograph that Schultes took in 1954 when he discovered Ebene, or at least was in the presence of Ebene, the blood-red resin derived from several species in the genus Varola in the nutmeg family. These powders are full of powerful tryptamines, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, uh, dimethyltryptamine, very close to brain serotonin. To have this stuff shot up your nose is rather like being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with Baroque paintings and landing on a sea of electricity. Uh, it doesn't really create the distortion of reality, it creates a complete elimination of reality. In fact, I used to argue with Professor Schultes that you couldn't classify this as being hallucinogenic because by the time you're under the influences, there was no one home anymore to experience the hallucinations. <laughs> but we're interested in these plants not simply because of their dazzling pharmacological effects, but what they tell us about a different way of knowing. Now, this is when it gets interesting. The reason the Yanomami blow those snuffs up the nose is because tryptamines are orally inactive. You cannot take them through the stomach because they're denatured by an enzyme in the human stomach called monoamine oxidase. They can only be taken orally if taken in conjunction with some other chemical that momentarily denatures the MAO in the human gut. Now, you've all heard, I'm sure, of ayahuasca, the vision vine, the vine of the soul, the most powerful preparation of the shaman's repertoire in the Northwest Amazon. It's not a plant, it's a combination of plants. On the one hand, the leaves of a nondescript shrub in the coffee family, full of these tryptamines. And on the other hand, the woody bark of a liana, totally different group of plants that has in it beta carbolines, harmine and harmaline, MAO inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate the tryptamines 
in the leaves. Now, none of you have to worry about that chemistry, but just think about this. How, in a flora of 80,000 species of vascular plants, did the indigenous people learn to combine these two morphologically distinct denizens of the rainforest to create this powerful synergistic effect, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts? The only scientific explanation is trial and error, which statistically is exposed as a meaningless euphemism. If you ask the people themselves, they say the plants teach us. What does that mean? In 1941, among the Siona Sequoia in eastern Ecuador, Schultes recorded 17 varieties of the woody liana, all of which were referable taxonomically to his Harvard-trained eye as being the same species. And when he asked them the nature of their systematics or classification, they looked at him as if he was a fool and said anyone who knew anything about plants would know the obvious. You take each one of the 17 on the night of a full moon and each variety sings to you in a different key. Now that's not going to get you a PhD in plant systematics at the University of Manitoba, but it's a hell of a lot more interesting than counting flower parts. But it also speaks of another depth of knowledge, which again comes out of the, uh, the, the, the common um, genius that we all share. Now, it gets even more interesting. All of you, I'm sure, have heard that the Amazon's a fragile place. You cut it down and you leave in its wake a, 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 a land of desolation. Well, this idea, which really grew out of an understanding of the fundamental difference between tropical and temperate forests, is generally true, but when applied to a landmass seven times the size of Ontario, it's as much slogan as science. We now know, for example, that there are areas in the Amazon collectively the size of France, of rich black soil of human origin. Our whole image of the Amazon as being fragile was driven by an environmental agenda and by the fact that when anthropologists in numbers came into the Amazon, the only surviving societies were small, endogenous societies like the Warani, often in open conflict with their neighbors, living at the headwaters of the Amazon, protected by geography to the east and by the Cordillera of the Andes to the west. And there was this sort of sense that the rest of the Amazon was empty. Well, it was in a sense empty because as all over the Americas, European diseases had swept away 95% of the people within a generation of contact. Remember, we use that word decimate. It's not the right word. Decimate in Latin means to kill one in 10. When smallpox and measles, influenza arrived in the Americas, it was 90% of the people that were swept away from the high Arctic to Tierra del Fuego. And Yet, if you look back at the journals of Aureliana in 1541, the first European to go down the Amazon, he didn't encounter an empty forest. He encountered a homeland of tens of millions of people. The question is, is there anywhere in the Amazon where the echoes of those ancient civilizations can still be heard? And the answer is yes. We now know that in the homeland of the people of the Anaconda, their social structures favor peace and exchange rather than conflict. They have wisdom traditions of incredible Baroque complexities. Their marriage rules encourage connection, not the least of which is you must marry someone who speaks a different language. So in any one longhouse, you have six and seven languages spoken, but you never hear a child practicing a distinct tongue. They simply wait, watch, listen, and one day begin to speak. And we're suddenly realizing now with our studies of the cosmology and the mythology of these incredibly sophisticated human beings that their entire cosmology is nothing more or less than a land management plan that dictates precisely how human beings in huge numbers can live in the Amazon. Now this entire world was almost swept away. And then an amazing thing happened. The president of Columbia said to a friend of mine, Martin von Hildebrand, do something for the Indians. And Martin, in five years of head of Indian affairs, did more than something. He secured legal land rights to an area collectively the size of the United Kingdom for 57 ethnicities of the Northwest Amazon. And behind that wall of isolation created by the modern problems of Columbia, in the absence of the federal state, a new dream of culture was born. I made a film in which for three days and three nights, 250 Barasana men in full regalia took ayahuasca to celebrate Cassava woman, the symbol of the feminine. And Stephen Hugh Jones, who had studied the, with the Barasana since 1968, flew in halfway through the project to help us. He saw this incredible event unfolding. He couldn't help but 
get on the satellite phone back to his wife in London. And Stephen had been part of a film series in the early 70s called Disappearing Worlds about Indigenous people. And he said to Christine by sat phone, Christine, you won't believe my eyes. The only thing that disappeared are the fucking missionaries. <laughs> And this is the point. You know, you know Justice Sinc Sinclair says there are only three questions. Who am I, where am I going, and where do I come from, where am I going? We asked some elders of the Batasana, why did you tolerate these missionaries? And they said something very profound, because they promised they could make us human. And that is exactly what that ideological fervor was all about. You know, to persuade the colonized of their own inherent inferiority. Now we realize that entire civilization could have been snuffed out, but a single political act of grace. So when people tell me that indigenous people are facing a one-way street down and there's nothing we can do about it, it is simply not true. Now, I was very fortunate that Professor Schultes also told me that I should look up his protege in Columbia, a lad called Timothy Plowman, for whom Schultes had got the dream academic assignment of the 1970s a quarter million dollars and a brand new Dodge pickup truck to study a plant known to the Inca as a divine leaf of immortality. And this, of course, was coca, the notorious source of cocaine. And even though this was our most important topical anesthetic, and even though the illicit trade was beginning to be a problem, nobody knew anything about the plant source, how many species yielded the drug, its point of origin. Nobody had ever done a nutritional study of the plant, even though it was consumed every day by millions of highland people in the Andes of South America. We did know that in the time of the Inca, it was so revered that unable to cultivate it at the elevation of the imperial capital of Cusco, they replicated in gold and silver leaf in fields that colored the horizon. And to this day in the Andes, no event occurs without a reciprocal exchange of the energy of this plant with the mountain deities, the Apus, that direct the destiny of all people. And we did do the first nutritional study of coca, and what we found horrified our backers of the US government. Yes, it had a small amount of cocaine hydrochloride, roughly analogous to the amount of caffeine in a coffee bean, and no one noticed the irony that at every drug abuse conference, all the narcs bolted for the coffee pot at 10 o'clock in the morning. But in addition to the small amount of alkaloid absorbed benignly, coca had more calcium than any plant ever studied, making it perfect for a diet that lacked a dairy product, particularly for young mothers. It had enzymes that enhanced the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, which made it perfect for the tuber-based diet. And it was also chock full of vitamins. So with one simple scientific assay, we put into stark profile these efforts that are underway to this day to eradicate the traditional fields. And we showed that this was a plant that had been used with no evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, for over 4,000 years. And so with coca as my lens, both metaphorically and literally, the ways of the Andes came slowly into focus. And I began to interest, become interested in this notion of sacred geography. And again, I don't mean in terms of hippie ethnography. What does it actually mean when a people say the land is alive? What's the difference between, for example, myself, who was raised in a world in which a mountain was simply a pile of rock ready to be mined, and my godson in Chinchero, outside of Cusco, raised to believe that a mountain is a deity that will direct his destiny? The important thing is not to say who's right and who's wrong but rather to observe that the belief system itself metaphorically determines the relationship between the community and that landmark with profoundly different consequences for the ecological footprint of a society. I was raised to believe that the forest of British Columbia existed to be cut. That made me very different than my friends in the Kwakwakawak who believed that those same forests were the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven that would have to be embraced during the Hamatsa initiation, such that the wisdom of the wild would come back to the community in the potlatch. Again, it's not who's right and who's wrong. It's a consequence of the belief. The First Nations lived on the coast of British Columbia for thousands of years with a very modest impact. My way of thinking tore those forests asunder in three generations. Now, these ideas play out in ritual in fascinating ways. And once each year in this stunningly beautiful valley, site of the summer palace of Topa Inca Yupanqui, the second of the Inca rulers, each boy, the fastest boy in each hamlet, is given the honor of becoming a woman. And for one day he must put on the clothing of his sister or his mother, and he becomes a wailaka, a transvestite. And he has to carry the banners of the community 
and all able-bodied men must participate in an arduous run. But it's not your ordinary run. You start off at 11,500 feet, you run down 2,000 feet to the base of the sacred mountain and to Kilka, and then you run to 16,000 feet, only to fall away to the sacred valley and cross two more soaring Andean ridges over the course of a long 24-hour race that is more ritual and ordeal than competition. And the metaphor is that you go into the mountains as a community of individuals, but through sacrifice and exhaustion, you remember the word sacrifice in English comes from the Latin to make sacred, you, have re you reaffirm your sense of belonging as you run the perimeter of your community lands, making that tremendous effort. And at the age of 48, um, my wife called it a midlife crisis, one of many, um, I became the first outsider and the oldest man ever to run the Mojimiento. And I managed to finish with the Wailacas, but only by chewing more coca leaves in one day than anyone in the 4,000 year history of the plant. <laughs> Actually, what got me through is I had baptized, not as a Christian, but I'd been asked to be the godfather of so many young kids in that village over 30 years, that when all, all my godfathers, for whom, my godchildren, for whom I sent them you know, pencils and bought cows for the family, when they heard that their padrino was stupid enough to uh, run the movimiento at the age of 48, they clung to me like limpets because they weren't going to let anything happen to their cash cow. Uh, <laughs> but these localized rituals become pan-Andean in these fantastic events like the Coeriti, where once each year tens of thousands of indigenous people converge on a sacred valley where a, a celebration happens. It's a perfect fusion of 400 years of Catholic faith and, and all those centuries of pre-Columbian intuitions. In the Southern Andes, the world that exists today is a syncretic world. A close friend of mine, Nilda Kalanalpa, I said, what do you feel when the anthropologists try to tell you what part of your life is Catholic and what part is, is uh, indigenous? She says, it just gives me a headache. You know? But the point is that this is a fusion of all those worlds. So the, there are symbols of, of Incan myth. There's costumes derived from the Spanish. The fundamental idea is you take the crosses of your community, carry them on your back through the seven stages of the cross, purely Christian in origin, but then you go up, up into the shadow of Ausangati, the most sacred mountain of the Inca, and the crosses are planted in the ice fields for uh, 72 hours. They absorb the power of Pachamama, and then they are carried back down to the community to revitalize it for another year. Now, if the Southern Andes is a fusion of these two worlds that came into such violent conflict at the time of the conquest, uh, there is one place in South America where the indigenous voice can still be heard unfettered. And that's among this most extraordinary complex of peoples that they call themselves the Elder Brothers. These are the Wiwa, the Arawakos, the Kogi, and the Kankwano, descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization which carpeted the Caribbean coastal plain of Colombia. In the wake of the violence of the conquest, their ancestors retreated into this isolated volcanic massif that soars to 20,000 feet, the highest coastal mountain range on Earth. And there, in a bloodstained continent, they were never conquered by the Spanish. And to this day, they are ruled by a ritual priesthood. Now, the training for the priesthood was first reported in the 1940s, and it was an extremely austere endeavor. The acolytes were taken away from their families at the age of two and three, sequestered in the shadowy world of darkness for 18 years, in which they would learn the values of their society, including the notion that their prayers and rituals literally maintain the cosmic balance. And then at the age of 18 or 19, having literally never seen a sunrise, never seen a horizon, the young lad is taken out on a pilgrimage to the very heart of the world, from the snow to the water, from the water of the sea back up to the ice fields of the goddess Saranqua. And suddenly he sees the world in all of its glory, and the priest who has trained him says, you see, it's as I've told you all these years, it really is that beautiful, it's yours to protect. Now this idea was a fable in anthropology because Reichel Domatov never saw a journey to the heart of the world. No anthropologist, no outsider had ever seen it. And then a magical thing happened. This man walked into my office at the National Geographic. His name was Danilo Villafania. And as he was chatting me, the Colombian ambassador, who was actually the daughter of that wonderful president who set aside all that land, I, 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 I couldn't help myself but interrupt Danilo and say, I don't mean to be rude, but you look like an old friend of mine. And I showed him this photograph that I had taken in 1974. 
And that man on the right is his father, Adalberto. And I said, Danilo, you may not, you may not remember, but when you were a baby, I carried you on my back up and down the mountains for months with your father. Well, his father had been murdered by the paramilitaries. And so this connection was so meaningful to Danilo. And this young lad here, Eugenio, is now this revered elder, second from the left here. And based on that kind of serendipitous connection, Danilo uh, invited us to go with the film crew, literally to, to film A Journey to the Heart of the World. And what we discovered is at least today, the acolytes don't spend 18 years in the darkness, but they spend 18 years in the environs of the men's ceremonial center, much of the time, indeed, at night, in the darkness, learning the Baroque religiosity of their tradition. And then suddenly, they do go on the journey. And the journey takes one across a stunningly beautiful landscape where every ripple in it resonates with mythological significance. Even the hats that the Arawakos weave are a conscious effort to mimic the ice fields that cover the flank of Saranqua. Well, because we were working with the indigenous organization, Gonavendua, this is a film that Arawakos wanted to make, and we've been training Wiwa uh, Kogi and Arawakos in cinematography. Everybody in the mountains, um, including, unfortunately, the gorillas, the FARC, knew where we were to be at every day. And when we reached the penultimate stage of the pilgrimage, we found the priests in a circle praying. And when they pray, they move their fingers because thoughts like prayers are seen to be threads. As you move up and down the mountains, you, your, your trajectory is seen to be a thread. The metaphor of this culture is upon this loom, I weave my life. And the FARC had come down through the community right at the time we had been scheduled to arrive to kidnap us. And we were just lucky that we were delayed by half a day. Now, you don't really have a dramatic escape on a mule. You kind of clip-clop your way to rescue. But we had to stash all our equipment, hand the cameras to our Wiwa colleagues to finish that section of the film, and in the light of a spectral moon, slipped out onto these paths that were so uh, steep going through the cliff faces that only the people knew about. And eventually, we got ourselves out of the problem and ran into a firefight between the FARC and the Colombian army. But we just went back to the sea, where even today the sacred sites are covered by skyscrapers and, and discotheques. But this does not stop the elder brother from doing what they know they must do, praying every day for our collective well-being. They call us, who they think have ruined the world, the younger brother. And they speak in full sentences and paragraphs about our need to change the way that we interact with the natural world. I've always lived by the adage that if it works, it's obsolete. After four years in South America, I was looking for something new. And there's always something waiting for you at the Botanical Museum in the office of Professor Schultes. And on a miserably wet day in early 1982, he summoned me to his office and asked me if I was interested in going down to the Caribbean island nation of Haiti, infiltrating the secret societies and securing the formula of a folk poison used to make zombies. Well, naturally, I said yes, uh, thinking that this might just be a lark, but in the end, it consumed four years of my life because within 24 hours of arriving in this African reality, something was sort of made available to me that had eluded me in South America, and that was a window truly wide open to the mystic. You know, it's interesting, were I to ask you to name the great religions of the world, what continent is left out? Sub-Saharan Africa. The tacit assumption being that African people had no religion. Well, of course they did. And voodoo is not a black magic cult. The word voodoo is simply a font word from Dahomey that means spirit or God. And voodoo is a quintessentially democratic faith, and like all religious traditions, it tries to understand the irre irrevocable separation that death implies and the fate of the spirit in the afterlife. And in many ways, it's the quintessentially democratic faith because a believer actually becomes the God. And when you are taken by the spirit, you do become the God. And that's why Haitians always used to say to me, you white people go to church and speak about God, we dance in the temple and become God. And indeed, African people move in and out of the spirit realm with an ease and impunity that is astonishing to behold. And when you are taken by the spirit, how can you be harmed? So you have these theatrical gestures, slicing into the skin with a knife before a fetish symbol in, in Togo in West Africa. Or in Haiti, voodoo acolytes in a state of trance, handling burning embers with impunity, a rather astonishing example of the mind's ability to affect the body 
that bears it during a state of extreme excitation. We have this idea that these cultures, quaint and colorful though they may be, are somehow destined to fade away as if by natural law, as if they're failed attempts at being modern, failed attempts at keeping up. Nothing could be further from the truth. Technology is no threat to culture. You know, the Lakota did not stop being Lakota when they gave up the bow and arrow for a rifle any more than a Canadian farmer stopped being Canadian when he gave up the horse and buggy for the automobile. And change is no threat to culture. In every case, these aren't delicate peoples. These are dynamic, living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And that's actually an optimistic observation because it su suggests that if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. Now, I wrote a, a book about my uh, investigations in Haiti that was made into the worst Hollywood movie in history. And Hemingway says that if you sell a book to Hollywood, you should start off in Arizona, drive to the California state line, and throw the book over and go back to Tucson and have a drink. Uh, I didn't do that. I disappeared into the forests of Borneo in Southeast Asia. I always wanted to live with a people wet with the innocence of birth, as I thought of it. Uh, nomads are profoundly different, and it's fascinating because for most of our history we were nomadic, wanderers on a pristine planet. It was only with the Neolithic Revolution 12,000 years ago that we succumbed to the cult of the seed, and the poetry of the shaman became the prose of the organized priesthood. And in nomadic societies, how do you measure wealth? when there's a disincentive to accumulate anything. Well, in the Penan culture, wealth is expli explicitly defined as a strength of social relations between people, because if they fray, everybody suffers. There is no word for thank you in the Penan language, because everything is reflexively shared, because you never know who will be the next to bring food to the collective table. I once gave a cigarette to a Penan woman and watched in my amazement as she pulled it apart to, in, to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably, rendering the product useless, honoring her obligation to share. And as in Inuit culture or Athabascan culture or any cultures that lack the written word, the entire vocabulary is, 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 the entire knowledge base of the society in some sense is a vocabulary of the best storyteller. And there's a kind of a relationship with the natural world that I've never been able to put my finger on, but an almost a, a dialogue such that in the same way that in a written culture, written, we, we can hear the voices of characters when we read a novel, my experience is that people like the Penan can almost metaphorically at least hear the voices of animals, such that the flight of a hornbill becomes a cursive script of nature, like a vocabulary written on the wind. But sadly, by the time I got to Southeast Asia, the sound of the forest was the sound of machinery, and the Penan were suffering from the highest rate of deforestation on the planet. And so a single generation, women were reduced to servitude and prostitution in these logging camps that turned the once clear rivers of Borneo into sort of slurries of, of, of silt that seemed to be carrying half the island away to the South China Sea where the empty freighters hung, ready to fill the holes with raw logs ripped from the heart of the Penan homeland. Children suffering from ailments not known before the imposition of settlement. Men humiliated, eventually standing up in this quixotic gesture blowpipes against bulldozers, eventually no match for the power of the Malaysian state, and within a lifetime, this way of life, morally inspired, inherently right, has fallen along with the force that gave it birth, and there is now no, a single Penan man or woman living in the ways of their ancestry. Now, these egregious industrial intrusions don't just happen in distant lands. This is my closest friend in British Columbia, a Taltan, uh, Oscar Dennis. This incidentally is a photograph that appeared in the National Geographic and when it did, women throughout the world made a beeline for Iskut, British Columbia. <laughs> Oz would call me up and say, hey Wade, Wade, I got this chick coming from Poland. I said, man, that's ridiculous. You just had someone from like Moscow there last week. I know. I said, you don't speak Polish or, you know, Russian. Well, they don't really come for conversation. <laughs> but I, you, know, this is a, a, you, know, you all know the story of the Taltan effort to protect the sacred headwaters, but I want to just stress one, one element of this. 
And that is the fact that the, the question is not mines or no mines, it's how many mines in what places at what cost to the environment and critically for whose benefit. You know, Oscar, I showed this to Premier Campbell, this photograph, and I said, and I had permission of Oscar's family to say this. I said, let me tell you what's happened to Oscar's family in the last five years. One brother hung himself in his mother's basement. A second brother died of medical malpractice in Prince George. A third brother drowned 10 feet from shore because he never learned how to swim. A sister died on the streets of Prince George. And Oscar's only daughter blew her head off playing Russian roulette with a handgun. We later learned that it was a drug hit uh, in revenge for something that daughter's mother had done. All that tragedy, and then I said to the Premier, in those years, Barrick Gold has taken 400 tons of gold and 5,000 tons of silver out of lands that by every definition of Canadian law and jurisprudence remains unceded territory of the Taltan First Nations, $25 billion of value, and I want to know why there's not a hockey rink in Iskit. I want to know why there's not a swimming pool in Iskit. I want to know why there are not trust funds in Iskit so that every kid there can go to college like my kids go. I don't want another one of those kids committing suicide while well, all that wealth is taken out of that country. It's just absolutely criminal in a country like Canada that that can happen. And so after... <laughs> so the issue, the issue isn't just crumbs at the table. These projects must prov provide revenues of, of a scale upon which nations can be rebuilt. And that's, to me, the ultimate challenge of the sacred headwaters. This is certainly how the, the First Nations feel about it. And, and one, one final point. What does it take to get a mine established in Canada? A bunch of white guys on a golf course cobble together a company with less history than my dog. They get online and secure the subsurface rights to a place they've never been, the pain of a long winter they've never experienced, nor the promise of a bright spring. And as long as they can guarantee the government a flow of revenue, either in royalties or taxation, they, by definition, secure the right to transform that land for all time. But what's fascinating, there's not a single metric in the calculus that rationalizes the industrialization of that piece of land that even attempts to put any value on it left alone. Or by contrast, any cost to the commons, the rest of us who aren't invested in that company, who aren't working for that company, implicit in its destruction. It's a little bit me, like me coming to your house in Yellowknife, you've got a rose garden, I offer to buy all your roses, and I'm such a good person with money, uh, I'll buy all your roses, I'll even give your kids jobs, but as I turn away with all my roses, I say over my shoulder, by the way, I'm destroying your house. And you say, well, who's going to pay for the house? I don't know, that's an externality. You know, that's not what we're talking about. And, and I just want to say that that's the way we think about land, but that's not the way the Taltan view the sacred headwaters. And that way of thinking of land does not, it does not exist outside of history and culture. It's a product of both. It's just one way of thinking, not the only way. And let's go to the opposite end of the world to see another way of thinking. And I'll take you to the most parsimonious, difficult continent on Earth and the homeland of the civilization of the Aboriginal people of Australia. Now, when the British arrived in Australia, they saw a people that looked weird, who had a simple technology, and what really offended the British about the Aboriginal people is that they had no interest whatsoever in progress or improving upon their lot. And because progress was the ethos of Victorian England, the British, in their inimitable way, concluded that the Aboriginal people were not human, and they began to kill them. As recently as 1902 in Australia, it was debated in Parliament as to whether or not Aboriginal people were human or not. As recently as the 1950s, ranchers got quotas as to how many Aboriginal people they were allowed to shoot on their land if they trespassed. As recently as the 1960s, a textbook used in schools all over Australia, a treasury of fauna of Australia, listed the Aboriginal people as amongst the interesting forms of wildlife of the country. But what was actually going on was a devotional philosophy too subtle for the British to understand, and that was the dreaming. And the dreaming is not a dream as we think of dreams. A dreaming is a description of a multidimensional state of reality in which the world, in the, in, in the phenomenological sense, exists, but more importantly, is constantly being born into the realm of the dreaming. The earth at your feet exists, but it's also constantly being brought into being by your imagination. So nothing has taken shape yet. And the entire purpose of life in Australia is to do nothing 
within, except within your clan territory, the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of the Rainbow Serpent. It's not a culture of progress, it's the opposite. A culture deeply conservative, a culture of stasis, constancy. It's almost as if, think of it, all Western society had been invested into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it just as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. The issue is not who's right and who's wrong. Had humanity as a whole followed the devotional trajectory of the Aboriginal people of Australia, we would not have put a man on the moon. But we also wouldn't be talking about climate change and our capacity to transform the biological support systems of the planet. Now finally, a big impact on culture is ideology, whether it be the ubiquitous cult of modernity or the violence of Marxist-Leninist thought. This is a nun that I met at Angkor Wat in Cambodia. You can see that her feet and hands have been severed from her body for, the, um, for having pursued her religious faith during the era of the killing fields. We entered Tibet, a place I spend a great deal of time, and we see the consequence of when Mao Zedong, the Marxist-Leninist materialist from Beijing, the man who was responsible for the death of more of his own people in his lifetime than Hitler and Stalin combined, when he whispered into the ears of the 14th Dalai Lama that all religion was poison, His Holiness knew what to anticipate. And when the jackboot of the Red Guard finally conquered Lhasa in 1959, 1.2 million Tibetans were killed for their religious faith. 6,000 temples and sacred structures were blasted apart. And what was it about Buddhism that so threatened the Marxists of Beijing? It's distilled in the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering. By that, the Buddha didn't mean that all life was, was negation. He just meant that shit happens. The second of the Noble Truths was the cause of suffering was ignorance. By this, the Buddha didn't mean stupidity. He meant the tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of our own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the Noble Truths was a revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth and most consequential was the delineation of a contemplative practice that had 2,500 years of empirical evidence to suggest that enlightenment was a true possibility, that a transformation of the human heart could occur. And so I decided to make a film that we call The Buddhist Science of the Mind. And I traveled with a good friend of mine, Mathieu Ricard, who's the translator for His Holiness in Europe. And Mathieu, and you can see it's a little bit like traveling in Sherwood Forest with Friar Tuck. Um, he came from an illustrious French family. His father was France's most famous philosopher, mother a great painter. If you can believe it, he learned piano from Stravinsky, photography, Henri Cartier-Bresson, he learned anthropology at the feet of Claude Lévi-Strauss. He himself was a molecular biologist studying in the lab of a Nobel laureate at the Pasteur Institute outside of Paris when he realized there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness. So he went back to where he had always been happy and became ordained as a Tibetan monk. Also with us was Shara Barma, a traditional Amshi doctor, seen here rather quizzically examining my urine sample. And under the guidance of Trusig Rinpoche, head of the Nyingma tradition, we began a journey to the heart of the Himalaya, to the flanks of Everest, but not to do what most Westerners do on Everest, which is to climb into a zone of death where oxygen deprivation alone obliterates consciousness, which from the Tibetan point of view is about the stupidest thing you could ever do with this precious incarnation. We actually went to be with a true Eastern hero, a bodhisattva, a woman who at the age of 15 had been betrothed to a wealthy merchant to escape his class because she wanted a, a life of religious devotion. She crawled down a human latrine, covered with excrement, turned up at the Temboche Monastery, was cleaned up, dispatched across a 23,000 foot pass into Tibet. She became ordained as a nun, came back over that pass, and then went into lifelong retreat, becoming Satsampa Ani. And for 45 years, she had lived in a space smaller than here to that desk, only doing one thing, reciting a single mantra day and night. And so we had an opportunity to meet her um, because of Sherab was treating her. And it began at this monastery of Shi Wang that clings like a swallow's nest to the southern Himalaya, the Mani Rimdu ceremony, the 18-day event that commemorates the transmission of the Dharma to Tibet. And then we set off on this long, long journey, high through the snowfields of the Himalaya, 
uh, to the cave where Sherab, as part of his seven years of medical training, spent one year in solitary retreat. Uh, to the very flanks on the eastern side of um, Everest, the Gama Valley, the hidden valley of Artemisia. And with Mathieu chanting the sutras, we finally made our way. And the photograph you're about to see is a photograph I took the instant that the door opened onto the face of a woman who had not seen the sunlight in 45 years. And by the terms of reference of our culture, I should have been greeted by a madwoman. Instead, I was greeted by a woman of loving, radiant compassion. And at that point, Matthew said to me, see, this is a proof of the efficacy of the science of the mind that is Tibetan Buddhism, the serenity of the practitioner after devotional practices. And that night at a nearby monastery, a lama said to me, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And so it leaves it to the rest of us as to ask ourselves, why is it we continue to tolerate the wrath of China in its attempts to sweep away a civilization that has given so much to the world? So finally, in the end, we ask ourselves, what kind of world do we want to live in? A monochromatic world of monotony or a polychromatic world of diversity? Margaret Mead said before she died was that her greatest fear was that as we sort of became this blandly amorphous global culture, not only would the range of the human imagination be reduced to a more narrow modality, but we'd forget that there had even been other possibilities for life. The issue isn't the traditional versus the modern. It's about the rights of free people, as Hugh Brody said, to choose the components of their lives. Nobody's talking about going back to a pre-industrial past or to keep anybody on Earth from the benefits of the modern uh, genius. The issue is to find a way that all peoples can indeed embrace the benefits of that genius but critically, without that engagement, having to, to demand the death of their, their ethnicity. Because if there's one thing that anthropology teaches, it's that culture is not trivial. Culture is not decorative. Culture is not the prayers we utter or the songs we sing. Ultimately, culture is a body of moral and ethical values that we place around each individual in each culture to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies just beneath each of us. It's culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, find order and meaning in the universe, to do as Lincoln asked us to do, always seek the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost, and when people through volition or coercion turn their backs on tradition, often aspiring to a level of wealth that will always be elusive, and they find themselves consistently only on the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere, immersed in a kind of sea of disaffection, disappointment, and alienation, you just have to look at these points of spasmodic conflict around the world. Pol Pot and the Killing Fields, butt-naked um, brigades of Liberia, the Shining Path in Lima, the Maoists at the gates of Kathmandu, and of course, in Rwanda, where I took these photographs just a month or two ago, the genocide that led to the death in one month of 700,000 people. Culture is not trivial. It's a glue that holds civilization together. Now, in the Canadian North, as just one final example, when the British arrived here, they saw a people that they took to be savages. The Inuit people took the British to be gods. Both were wrong, but one did more to honor and dignify the human race. And what, of course, the British failed to understand was that there was no better measure of genius than the ability to survive in a harsh environment where, in the absence of wood, everything had to be made from the cold. The Inuit, as you all well know, didn't fear the cold. They took advantage of it. The runners of the sleds were originally made of char, put in a row and wrapped in the skin of a caribou hide. And this is a photograph I took about 250 kilometers on the ice beyond Glulik when some friends of mine were polar bear hunting and I was amazed the temperature that night, as you up here certainly have experienced, dropped to minus 65 Celsius. And they simply made a structure, an igloo, and we ate the food that they had killed that day. And despite what Greenpeace continues to say, blood on ice in the Arctic is not a sign of death, but an affirmation of life itself. And I was just astonished to see, as we all are, the extraordinary ability and, and the genius of, of Inuit people. And I want to uh, end with a kind of a prophetical story. When I was narwhal hunting at the tip of Baffin Island with some friends from, uh, from Arctic um, Bay, 
Olayak here told me a story of the terrible time in Canadian history when we forced the Inuit in the settlements to establish our sovereignty in the Canadian North. And his grandfather refused to go, and the family took away all of his tools and implements, thinking that he would force him into the settlement. And Olayak told me that his grandfather slipped outside of the igloo, pulled down his caribou hide trousers, and defecated into his hand. And as the feces froze, he shaped it in the form of an implement. And as the implement took final form, he put a spray of saliva on it and killed a dog. Skinned the dog, used the skin of the dog to make the traces of a sled, used the rib cage of a dead dog to make an um, improvised sled, and shit knife and belt disappeared in the Arctic night. Now, of course, I thought he was completely pulling my leg. But then I read in the journals of Peter Freuken on the 5th Thule expedition in the Barren Lands, Peter Freuken gets stuck out on the ice, he makes a trough in the snow, pulls his his sled on top of him. Before he know it, he's made a coffin of his own making. And in his journal, he says, I thought of making a shit knife, but I really couldn't maneuver, so I did this. No one's saying there's an assembly line creating shit knives in the Arctic. But what I'm saying is that the idea is too beautiful not to tell the story, because it's such a perfect symbol for the adaptability and the genius of people forging a life from the cold. And it's the same way, in a sense, that a towel left out overnight can become a shovel by morning. But of course, the reason I mention all that is only partly tongue-in-cheek, because the sad thing is that the Inuit people who have endured in such short period of time so much, the devastating diseases, the culture of poverty, the residential schools, the, the drug addiction, the, the, the conquest itself, and suddenly with the dream of Nunavut and new possibilities in the north, just on the eve of a total revitalization, here comes something beyond their capacity to deal with, and that's climate change. This is a photograph that I took in the northernmost inhabited community in the world, in Kanak in northwest Greenland. The people there decided they have all the modern tools that they need, but they made a decision not to allow skidoos because they understood that dogs were the cultural pivot, the transmission of knowledge, father to son, mother to daughter, and it's made for a very healthy community. But sadly, the ice that used to come in in September and stay till July now comes in in November and is gone by March. And so throughout the entire um, Arctic, this world is melting. And it's very important for those of us who are non-native to remember that for us, climate change may be a scientific challenge, a political debate, a technological um, miasma. But for so many indigenous people around the world who actually believe that they are responsible for the well-being of the, of the natural world, it's become a profoundly spiritual and psychological dilemma because the loss of uh, the, the transformation becomes their fault. So I'll just leave you with the final thought that I, I hope you've come to understand the central lesson, I guess, of this talk, which is that every culture has something to say, and each one deserves to be heard. And we need the thoughts of these young um, Inuit kids. We need the prayers of these Tibetan monks to be. We need the hopes of this young warrior I lived with on the Serengeti of Kenya. And, uh, because in the end, for all of us, wherever we live, their prayers and their thoughts and their ideas are part of our collective geography of hope. When we lose a culture, we lose something of ourselves. Thanks very much.